from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the library's reading and literacy uh, promotion arm. Uh, we're pleased to have you here today for a program about a librarian uh, who had a, many special connections to the Library of Congress, but is better known for uh, the kind of work that she did that you'll hear about from our speaker. Uh, the Center for the Book itself is involved in a number of promotion activities related to the library. Uh, we have a state network with affiliates in every state. We have reading promotion partners with groups with whom we have projects. And we also play a very major role in the National Book Festival of the Library of Congress. Here at the library, we also have not only this series, uh, of noontime talks by authors of books that have a special relationship to the library. Uh, but we also uh, are the administrator for the Young Reader Center at the library, the Poetry and Literature Center, uh, and most recently, the relatively new Library of Congress Literacy Awards, which are funded by the benefactor David Rubenstein. And it's a five-year project. We're now reaching the halfway point and I hope very much that uh, we can prove the worthiness of this project for continuation um, at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Books and Beyond talks are recorded and later uh, put on the Library of Congress's website. So I do ask you to uh, turn off all electronic items. I want to say a word about our co-sponsor, which is the uh, Daniel Murray Daniel A.P. Murray African American Culture Association uh, of the Library of Congress. Uh, the, it is just celebrated its 35th, 35th year, and I wanted to point out that I actually had a project that was related before the Center for the Book was created, uh, which was 1977. Uh, I actually worked with Dorothy Porter uh, in 1969 and 1970 on a project that Janet mentions barely, but it's in her book, <laughs> and that was uh, looking at the Daniel Murray collection and sorting it out with duplicates being sent to the Howard University Library. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience for me. She was very knowledgeable, uh, easy to work with, but boy, she wanted as much as she could get from our duplicates from the Daniel Murray collection, and I don't blame her one bit. Uh, the result was a addition to the uh, Howard Library, but also a sorting out of the pamphlets related to Mr. Murray. Now, Mr. Murray was a Library of Congress employee who reached the, t the uh, title of assistant librarian. He was hired in 1871. And he uh, didn't. He worked at the library until 1922, uh, which is a long period through a number of librarians. Uh, he was known as a bibliographer of African American materials. Not only did he collect them, but he represented the Library of Congress in 1900. I think Janet at the uh, World's Chicago, excuse me, Chicago uh, Paris Exposition where the Murray collection of books on colored authors was on display, and it also went to a couple of other institutions in the first decades of the uh, 20th century. Uh, he was hired by the Librarian of Congress named Ainsworth Rand Spofford. He was hired in 1872. In the end, he worked for another famous Librarian of Congress, Herbert Putnam, uh, who actually was librarian all the way until 1939. So Mr. Murray uh, is commemorated by the association, which has his name now, and has been really a principal, uh, really acquisitions <laughs> librarian uh, for the Library of Congress, and is really, his collection is one of the basis of our uh, African-American collections. Um, I also uh, 
wanted to remind you that, oh, I did remind you already that we're turning off all electronic things. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker, who is Janet Sims Wood, and she is the former assistant librarian of the Moreland Springham Collect Research Center at Howard University. She currently serves as an associate librarian at Prince George's Community College in Maryland. Janet was a founding associate editor of SAGE, a scholarly journal on black women. Uh, she currently serves as a national vice president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And she has won numerous awards and grants for her research in African American history. And she is the author of this handsome book, uh, recently published by History Press, which is a biography of Dorothy Porter Wesley at Howard University, Building a Legacy of Black History. It's my pleasure now uh, to introduce Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. I see so many friends in the audience. As I was telling them, I used to work at the library many, many moons ago, back in the 60s at the Navy Yard and Cod Division. So, and then uh, lots of friends here uh, through the years, some of who worked at Moreland Spingarn with me and are now here at the library. But um, this is, book is a labor of love. I wanted to do something to honor Dorothy Porter because you know, Moreland Spingarn's uh, 100th anniversary was coming up, and I really wanted to do something to honor the lady whose shoulders that we, we stood on. A um, couple of things that uh, things that about the book. First of all, with History Press, there's a word limit. We can only do so many words. They like History Press is a press that really pre does presses for the general public, so they want it to be very, not real, real scholarly. Lots of pictures. So, uh, and that was, as I said, that was a word limit. So um, we had to work with that. And um, I don't know if you notice on the bottom of the book, there's a lady's name there by the name of Charlene Spencer Pine who used to work here. Uh, she was the lady that came in and uh, she became my copy editor, but became much more than the copy editor. She really, really, really helped me go through this document to make it look good, make it sound good. And you know, when you're an author and somebody goes through your stuff, and they, nope, that's not, nope, we're gonna take this out, we need to move this here, move that there. So, but by the time it got to History Press, when they sent it back, there were very, very few corrections we had to make because she was that meticulous. Uh, we had two computers sitting there, fact checking, you know, no, no, we gotta make sure that this is right, make sure this is spelled right, make sure, that, so we, so Charlene really gave me a lot of help and I do appreciate that and I wanted to, to acknowledge her because she is a former employee here at the Library of Congress. The other, one of the major problems I had in doing the book was her collection, Dorothy Porter Wesley's collection at Yale. Uh, as you know, the collections, uh, went to three different places. Her first husband's collection, uh, James Porter's collection went to Emory. The uh, second husband's collection, jo uh, Charles Wesley's, uh, with the Alphas, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Hopefully those will come to Howard at some point since we do have the uh, Alpha papers there. Uh, and then her collection went to Yale. Well, when I went to Yale, I had a week there uh, and there's 137 boxes of unprocessed materials. <laughs> I got to go through 18 of those boxes in that week's time. So I know I missed a lot. Uh, it's, and the fact that it was unprocessed, there was just things everywhere. It all, it, it was, some of it was by year or maybe by topic or something, but then you'd find other stuff there. Uh, photos in every collection. So what I'm hoping, uh, in fact, I even found some dental floss in one of the boxes. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what I'm hoping that this book will generate is that either a library student that's doing a dissertation may hopefully, once that collection is processed at Yale, because that's the key at this point is, is for that process, collection to be processed, somebody may want to do a doctoral dissertation on her or either another more scholarly book, which she deserves. She deserves a much more scholarly book than we have here. I'm hoping that once that collection is processed and open back to the public again, that somebody else will come along and update this and 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 uh, and uh, really give her the scholarly uh, that she deserves. Um, so, but that was the the major things that I had to deal with was that that collection at Yale was really, really, really something. Uh, now, as I say, this was a labor of love because I wanted to do something to honor the lady whose shoulders I stood on 
she had uh, retired the year before I came, but of course she was back and forth in the collection. I was at her home many times, so uh, I knew her very well. And uh, so uh, this, again, was something I just really wanted to do to honor her. And what I'm gonna do, the main f focus of the presentation is basically her work at Howard University, but I will tell you that she was born uh, in New Jersey, Montclair, New Jersey, in 1905. And then when she came down to Minor's Teachers College, uh, and that's where she went to college uh, in 1925. Uh, after that, while she was at Minor, her, her librarian there uh, took a liking to her. So she wanted to become a librarian. So she started uh, Columbia Library School. Um, and she graduated from there in uh, 1932. She came to Howard also in, in the 20s, late 20s, and was there. Uh, she worked on a degree there as well. But during her time at, uh, at um, New York, when she was working there, she met a young man by the name of James Porter. And so she had two reasons for coming to Washington, D.C. So she, <laughs> she had met James Porter, and then she was asked, she was working at the, uh, at the library in New York, and James Reason, Joseph Reason, excuse me, who was uh, a librarian at Howard, also working there part-time, asked her to come down to Howard to work because they, he knew that they were getting ready to hire her full time at at, uh, uh, in the, at the New York Library. So he said, when she told him, well, you haven't told me about a job yet. She, you haven't given me. she said, you got a job, come down there. So she had two reasons for coming to, uh, uh, to Howard University. So in 1929, she and James Porter got married because you know the, the thing about students and teachers not dating. So uh, they got married in 1929 and uh, in 1930, when she came there, she was uh, a cataloger, and in 1930, she was made head of what was called the Negro uh, Division there. So uh, that is where I'm going to start uh, with the presentation. Um, Kelly Miller was the person that talked Jesse Moreland into giving the collection in 1914, and then the paperwork was signed in 1915 to the Moreland Spin Garden to Moreland Spin Gun Research Center to Howard University. And so he is really credited with being the person that really talked uh, uh, him into giving that collection. Uh, the next picture is of Jesse Moreland. Uh, okay, right here. Okay. Now, Jesse Moreland, as I say, we, we received his collection in 1914. It had about, um, th at that time, it had about 3,000. Uh, books in the collection and things of that nature. So that was part of the collection. We had a couple of other collections there, uh, the Tappan Collection and a few others. So when Dorothy Porter came, the first thing she did was to go through the collections and start pulling out from the main library, pulling out the materials that would be part of this Negro collection. So uh, Jesse Morton's collection there. Uh, the next picture is of Mordecai Johnson, who was Howard University's first African-American president. And uh, so he came there a couple of years before, before Dorothy came, got there. Mm -hmm. And the next picture is of Arthur B. Spingarn. Now, uh, Howard University purchased uh, Spingarn's collection in 1946. So that's how you get the Moreland-Spingarn uh, part of the collection. So. Um, and he had a very, very large collection that came there as well. Uh, all of these people were bibliophiles and collectors, so, um, and Arthur Spingarn's collection especially had lots of information, uh, lots of books in foreign languages. Uh, uh, he uh, really collected on Negro authors is what he was collecting at that time. So um, very, very vast collection, okay. And this is um, the Howard University Bulletin, and this was when they dedicated the, um, uh, Ben Garn collection there, and you'll see Dorothy Porter uh, and Joseph Reason sitting there. Okay. Most people recognize Dorothy Porter as an older lady. Now, the picture that I have on the cover, uh, I really like that picture. It's a young, it was a younger picture of her, but it also showed her working. And and one of the things I wanted, I liked about that cover picture was the fact that on the side you see the card catalog, which most students don't know, any, know anything about today. And uh, so I wanted them to see that, you know, how we worked. I have two card catalogs in my house, but uh, most students don't know about card catalogs now because almost everything is, uh, is digitized and uh, not digitized, but uh, you, you go through uh, you know, the internet to get to the, to the collections, what's in, what's in each collection. So on the other side was, I don't know if you saw on the other side, 
uh, on that picture, there's a, a dial-up telephone on the side, which again, a lot of our students don't know about. And uh, there was an inkwell in front of her as well, which a lot of our students don't know about. So I wanted to show a picture of a time period that we could talk about and what was going on at that time period, but I really want to show her working, okay? Dorothy, uh, this is one of her in the Spingarn collection, which is in the main reading room. The Spingarn collection is, uh, if you go in the Moreland room, the Spingarn collection is right there that, on that level, and then the Moreland collection is in the, is in the back and upstairs on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Dorothy Porter uh, working in the stacks, and that's where you usually found her, because somebody was always coming in asking for, for information, and she was very, very helpful to people. She helped uh, many, many scholars that came there. She helped the students. Uh, one of the things that she did uh, to help the students at Howard was that she sent reading lists out to the instructors like Benjamin Brawley, Elaine Locke, um, so that they would know what she had received in, in their sections so that they could send their students over to do research. So, um, and then of course, as her name got to be known and uh, scholars came from all over the world to help her. And this is her again in the reading room uh, helping the students and you will see Jesse Moreland's picture over, over the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, as I was saying, she helped so many people. These were some young girls that came from New Guinea. They came to study English in, in Washington, D.C. So she was instrumental in helping them get housing, making sure that they were fed, and making sure that, uh, that everything was going right for them. So again, that's what she did. She made, a, uh, made a, an effort to make sure that she helped people. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Ford Foundation started giving out a lot of grant money to uh, institutions. So this is a group of uh, black history specialists. Uh, most of them were black history chairs. Uh, you see Dorothy Porter there and a few others. Uh, they went out to a conference in Aspen, Colorado uh, because they were getting ready to start writing grants to try to get collections. One of the librarians told me that although, you know, like many of the colleges, especially the smaller schools, did not have grant offices, so the folk that didn't know how to write grants, the librarians and the teachers that didn't know how to write those grants that could get them funded, what they would do, they would have the smaller schools send, the collect, send their grant application to them first. They would tweak it before it went into the grant agency. Because what we wanted to do was to make sure that people across the country, libraries across the country, not just Moreland, not just Schomburg, would have black history collections. And that was one of the things that they really worked on to try to get. To, to help the other schools get their collections as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Dorothy Porter over in Africa. She went to Africa and she, uh, this was a picture of her, she was there at, on a Ford Foundation grant from 62 to 64 and she helped them set up the National Library of uh, Nigeria and this is she with the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, um, she's at a Nigritude conference uh, in Dakar in 1971. Again, she traveled the world um, as, as, they, as, she became, as she became more popular, she got more and more invitations to do things of this nature. So uh, she was more than just a librarian. Mm -hmm. And this is she and her first husband, James, uh, James Porter, and they are at a, at a cocktail party in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. This is Joseph Reason, and he, uh, at that time, Moreland was under the, under the main library, so he was uh, her boss. So this was at uh, his retirement party in uh, 1973. Dorothy also received lots and lots and lots of plaques, uh, again, for helping so many people. This is from uh, Howard's Institute for Arts and the Humanities. Uh, so she got all kinds of uh, awards that came into her. And when we went to her house, she had most of those awards sitting. Uh, she had a wall, a special wall, just for, uh, to show the plaques and things that she had gotten. Now, Dorothy retired in 1973, and as I was telling folk, uh, the next few pictures are of her retirement party. but she didn't just retire and go home. She worked, in fact, she was working on a book when she died at, at, uh, at 90. So uh, she, uh, she worked until she passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, these are some of the pictures um, uh, at Howard from her retirement party. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go through these fairly fast so that we have a little time for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when Dorothy retired, uh, the main reading room was also named the Dorothy P. Porter Room uh, in her honor. So right behind them, and you see Sterling Brown standing there with, beside her, uh, uh, and then you go into the main reading room. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this is a couple of other pictures of her at her retirement uh, party. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, she was also part of uh, the Schlesinger Library's or History. They had a Black Women's or History project, and she was on uh, the committee to help them. She again, she was on so many different committees and things of that nature, working with so many different people to help them get their projects off the ground and running. So she was extremely helpful in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is Dorothy Porter. She, after she retired from Howard, here she comes back. And she worked with all of us. Uh, there she's working in the manuscript division with the manuscript staff. Uh, and of course, you know, we had a large black newspaper collection. In fact, uh, for our newspaper collections, we got a lot of newspapers from Africa uh, and from the Caribbean so that students would, could come in and they could read uh, their home papers when they came in. So uh, the newspapers got a, a lot of attention. And of course, she also got uh, received some grants to also uh, put the put these newspapers on microfilm because, as you know, after a while they start yellowing and uh, falling apart. So she was instrumental in getting several grants to uh, uh, put microfilm microfilm those collections. Okay, uh, this is Dorothy Porter getting an award as an alumni award from Howard University in 1974 uh, because she did graduate from Howard as well. Mm -hmm. um, for all you Deltas out there, she, is, she was a Delta, and this is one of the awards that they gave her. So again, she, got, she received so many plaques and awards. This is from um, a book party for Sharon Harley and Watson Torborg Pence, African American Women's Struggles and Images. They really credit Dorothy Porter with doing so much to help them get this book published. So they really wanted, and then when they redid the book, they uh, also dedicated it to her. So she, again, especially, especially all of us that were in black women's history, and in the 70s was when we started doing the, teaching the classes in black women's history and things of that nature. So most of us that were librarians, we were the ones that were trying to make sure that we got them to uh, let them know where the materials were that they could use in their classes. And uh, so she was very, very instrumental in helping us to make sure that we got the, the materials on black women's history to all those teachers that were teaching uh, black women's history, even though she wasn't with us, at, uh, wasn't employed with us at the time, but she made sure that we were, and I'm gonna make sure that the librarians came there and that we were all helping people to get their information. Mm -hmm. This is she with her second husband, um, Charles Wesley. Um, they got married late in life in the late uh, 70s, 80s, I think it was, when they got married. Um, she married in 1979 uh, to, to uh, uh, Charles Wesley. And of course, she was married to two famous men. So James Porter, who ended up being chair at Howard, and uh, Charles Wesley was uh, president of two different black universities, and he was a mason. So uh, a very, very promise, promising people that she married. Uh, this is a dedication of the Howard University Museum on the far end of the, when you go into the library on that left-hand side all the way down to the end, is the Howard University Museum. Um, the person that was instrumental in starting that action, again, was Kelly Miller. He wanted to set up, and back, uh, he was writing letters all over the place to people trying to set up a Howard University uh, Black History Museum. And of course, he died before that uh, came to being, and it did not come to uh, fruition until 1979, but it was his dream for a National Negro Library and Museum. So this is she with uh, uh, President James Porter, James Porter, James Cheek, uh, opening up the museum, cutting the ribbon. And this is she on the inside. Now, what the museum did, we had lots of different artifacts and things. So, you know, we had the book collection there, but you can't put the artifacts and things that we got. Like we, uh, uh, we had Frederick Douglass's eyeglasses and skull caps, for instance. Uh, we had African gold weights. Uh, so we had sculpture pieces. So those are, we wanted to show some of those pieces that uh, were part of the collection as well. So uh, the Howard University Museum uh, would do that. So we would. Uh, have different exhibits in there uh, showing off what we had in our collection. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this is Dorothy Porter at one of the author book signings. So she was up, uh, again, she always went to book signings, and most times you would look in books from almost all over the country. Everybody had to come there. She, her name was in most of those books because she was instrumental in helping everybody. I mean, she helped everybody. Uh, John Blassingame, uh, she helped uh, John Hope Franklin, for instance, uh, when he wrote his book on George Washington Williams. She was instrumental in helping him get that off the ground. He came in there one day. He told her he was working on this man. He couldn't find any information. 
two or three days later, here comes Dorothy Porter with a letter from George Washington Williams to uh, Mordecai Johnson uh, wanting to uh, come to school there. He said that was the spark that really got that book off the ground because it's, that letter told a lot about his family and uh, their travels and things of that nature and why he wanted to come to college. So again, she helped pretty much everybody. And one of the things I tried to do in the book uh, was to talk to people and let them tell some stories about, since I'm an oral historian, I couldn't talk to her, so I wanted to talk to people that had that she had helped and, and uh, so they could tell those stories about uh, their encounters with her. And there's some interesting things in there that she, uh, uh, people that she, uh, that she helped and, uh, and how she helped them. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, she had one daughter, uh, one child, and that's Connie. And that's she and Connie uh, at the piano. Now, Dorothy Porter had been playing, playing the piano since a little girl. And that is how, as a little girl, that's how she earned money. She used to teach, uh, uh, in, in New Jersey, she used to teach music, piano lesson, to the other students there. I think it was a dollar lesson, something like that. So uh, that's how she made her little spending money. So she was a, a, a very accomplished cook as well. Uh, this is Dorothy Porter, and as you see, uh, Betty Culpel, there you are. <laughs> this is at the Black Bibliophiles Conference at Howard University in 1989. One of the things that we wanted to do was to profile people that were collecting in black history. Uh, so what we wanted to do, we brought some of those bibliophiles that were still living, like Charles Bloxon, for instance, and uh, of course, Dorothy Porter was still uh, living and collecting. So we wanted to bring some of those people there, and, and then uh, some of the people gave papers on the ones that were no longer with us, to talk about how they collected materials. And one thing that you found out was that they kind of worked together. Like if one person found out that you were looking for something and they, could, they knew where it was, they would let you know, okay, you can find this particular book at you know, this particular place. So uh, they, they kind of helped each other try to find materials because all of them, again, were collecting. And of course, Dorothy had a big collection at her house as well, not just at Moreland. She, was a, she collected a lot of materials. So, uh, I understand that she, when she moved to Florida, they had a house and an apartment, and all both were filled with, with Dorothy's materials. Uh -huh. Now, this is one of the many honorary degrees that she got. She got this from Syracuse University in 1989. Uh -huh. uh, this is Dorothy at the uh, Harvard University W.E. Du Bois Institute. She went there in 1989 to uh, as a as a scholar that that year. And one of the things that uh, one of the, told me was that she was afraid that once she, because she was an older person, that she was going to be there with all those young people. And she was kind of, you know, afraid that she wouldn't fit in. Well, at the first meeting, the director told me, said, well, they were talking about, going to talk about their project. So Dorothy got up and said, well, she says, you know, I've only written 18 pages. And everybody's standing there looking at her because they said, we, ha we hadn't even finished unpacking. We hadn't written a thing. So, uh, but then when everybody started talking about their projects, of course she knew something about every project that they were talking about and told them where to find the information. So she became the belle of the ball that year uh, at, at the Harvard, uh, Du Bois Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Dorothy signing one of her books, Early Negro Writing. Um, now that book was republished uh, by the uh, Black Classic Press by, by Paul Coates. And, um, he also published the last book that she did as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, her with Camille Billups. Uh, because her husband was an artist, she also had lots of friends that were artists. So Camille had her to come up and uh, do a presentation at the, at the, at the Hatch Billups uh, Gallery in New York. So again, Dorothy Porter traveled all over the place. She knew pretty much everybody. So. Uh, again, if you were doing research in black history, you absolutely had to come to Moreland Spin Garden. You almost did not have a choice in that matter. So again, she knew everybody. The next few pictures are, uh, we started having what we call a Dorothy Porter Wesley Lecture Series. And uh, what Thomas Battle wanted to do was to bring librarians in from across the country uh, every year to talk about the, the field that they were in. And one of the things he said was that Dorothy, all of them gave Dorothy Porter Wesley credit because she had been instrumental in helping all of them uh, get, their, get their materials and get the jobs that they had. So she would write reference letters for you and things of that nature. Okay. And that's she and her daughter and son-in-law in the audience uh, at the, one of the programs. Uh -huh. uh, this one here, I'm, I, 
I need to move this around a little bit. Uh, this was at Mordecai Johnson's 100th anniversary dedication, and she appeared on that as well. Again, she she was on almost all panels and things of that nature, dealing with black history. She, you, If you named it, she was pretty much there. Okay, And I'm going back now to the uh, lecture series. This is she with um, Clara Stanton Jones uh, sitting next to her. Clara Stanton Jones was the first African-American director of uh, of the Detroit Public Library and the first black president of ALA. So again, just helping all kinds of people. This is uh, E.J. Josie, Dr. E.J. Josie. Now he had been a student at Howard. He told me, he has said in one of his letters that she was instrumental in him going to library school. And then E.J. Josie went on to do the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And this book just won an honor book award uh, from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Uh, I guess got my letter a couple of weeks ago, so uh, it's, one, it's, it's, one, it's won an award. Okay. Uh, this is Hardy Franklin, who was uh, one of the uh, directors of the D.C. Public Library. Uh, so sh she had people from all over the country to come in and talk. Uh, this is Mary Lennox, who was dean of the uh, University of Missouri Library School. So these are just a few of the people that she had uh, that that they had come in. As I say, Dr. Battle wanted people that were very prominent. He also had um, uh, the librarian uh, that uh, uh, Major Owens, uh, who was a librarian, uh, who was a congressperson. So he had him come one year. So we had all kinds of people coming in that were in the library field. Jesse Carney Smith from Fisk University. So uh, to talk about their field and also to talk about how Dorothy Porter Wesley had helped them. And in 1995, right before she died, she was our guest lecturer. And one thing that she talked about was the fact that she didn't want to talk about her. She said, you know enough about me. What she wanted to do was to update uh, the last history of Howard University. She wanted to do a Howard University encyclopedia. And uh, so, um, of course, that never came to be in. But that was really what her, her, her aim was in her latter years, was to get that started. Uh, this is uh, Dorothy Porter at the, uh, one of the Asala conferences. Dorothy Porter was um, very, very active in the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. She served on the Executive Council for many, many, many years and thereafter came to almost every conference up until around 93 or 94. I think that might have been her last conference. But she was at every conference and people would just flock around her because most of those scholars that had come there had written books and things had come to Dorothy Porter for help. So everybody came there to, 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 to talk to Dorothy Porter, and that's her with Lerone Bennett. Okay. And the last picture uh, I'm going to show you is uh, in 1994, the um, Humanities Council, NEH, gave, gave out the Charles Frankel Award, and that year, 1994, uh, she received the award, and it was given to her at the White House by, uh, by President Clinton. Okay. So I'm going to stop there, but let me read one thing. Uh, to sum up what a couple of people had to say about Dorothy Porter. Uh, Thomas Battle, of course, who was uh, uh, who's the retired director of Moreland Spingarn, said, um, said, Thomas Battle, commenting on Porter's influence on the staff, said, quote, to MSRC staff, the patron was not just a patron. There was, no, there was so much shared interest. There was always a staff member interested in the subject area of a visiting patron. Staff did just not point the patron to a book, but became a part of their research. Dorothy advised the patron by sharing her own intellect, and this continued on with the staff that came after her. And on in her contribution, Thomas Battle said, those of us who know how difficult the task is of documenting a people's history, realize and appreciate the extraordinary success Dorothy Porter Wesley achieved in times far more difficult than those we face today. She built a house and we are its caretakers, trying, and we are trying our best to deserve the wonderful legacy she left for us and future generations. And John Bracy, who became head of the Du Bois Institute uh, at Harvard, uh, used to be a student at, uh, he, was a, he grew up in Washington, so as a child, his mother worked on the campus, so he would come over to the library uh, and go to sleep in, that, in one of those big leather, brown leather chairs that was in there, and he would do his homework. And he said a lot of the faculty members would, would check his homework, and he said Dorothy Porter would often take him to the back 
and show him pictures and documents uh, dealing with black history because he, you know, he kept saying, well, I don't believe that, that we've done that much. And, he, and she would always take him to the back so that he could see uh, what, she, uh, what we had done. So, and he says that, uh, and I think he mainly expresses it best about her work and, and about us and about her support for people's projects. He says, Dorothy Porter, Without, mu uh, without much deserved support, financial or institutional, but with much love, insight, and energy, nurtured, maintained, and expanded one of the world's greatest collections of manuscripts and print materials on the African American experience. We as scholars and guardians of that experience owe Dorothy Porter a debt we can never fully repay. We owe to her memory the obligation to try to carry on her work and legacy to the best of our ability. Thank you very much. So, uh, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to see if I hopefully answer them for you. Yes. I have a question. This is a detail, but I'm curious. How did the bulk of her papers end up at Yale? Um, Do you want to repeat the question? Yes. It was asked, how did the bulk of her papers end up at Yale? Her daughter had uh, access to all the collections. You know, once, all, uh, once Dorothy died, and both of her, her father and her stepfather had passed. So she owned those collections. And um, so what she did, she put them up for auction. And so that was how they ended up at three different places. Uh, they were purchased, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me. I can't remember that right now. But it was on. It was a book that. Uh, it was uh, on William Nail. So she wrote. She her husband had been working on that, and so she wanted. In she wanted to finish his book. Uh, Charles Wesley was working on that, so she wanted to finish it up. And but she passed before it finished. And her daughter ended up finishing it for her. Uh -huh. And it's published by, by Black Classic Press. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, Dorothy had a very outgoing personality, and and I could. It's only been these last couple of years, I guess, since I worked on the book that I can actually now call her Dorothy. She used to tell her all the time, "Please call me Dorothy," and I couldn't do it. So <laughs> Paul Coates said he still can. But she was again. She was so helpful to people. Uh, but the only thing that most people would tell you, Thomas Battle, Deborah Newman Ham that used to work here, they always said that she, she didn't suffer fools. You had to prove to her that you were a serious researcher. So she made sure that, that when, you, when you came there that you knew what you were doing and that uh, and so that she would give you the help that you needed. And again, she gave so many people help. Uh, one lady told me that uh, she was working on a, on a project and Dorothy Porter called her one day and said, uh, this place, uh, this government agency is going to call you. And she said, now since you're doing research, I'm going to tell you one thing. You don't have to tell them everything. Save something for your book. And she said that was the best advice that a young scholar could have received because she was, you know, she was going to talk and tell them everything. And, but she said, no, you save it for, save some of it for your book. And the same lady also told me that she came down to, um, to Washington to, um, and as I say, Dorothy Porter had so much materials at her own house. So uh, she invited her over to the house to look at some materials uh, on some 19th century black women that she had. And she said, Dorothy kept going, but she said, oh, I have something under the bed upstairs. And she run and grabbed that and she could. And so, uh, and she said that later on in the afternoon, uh, uh, Dorothy came and told her, she said, Charles and I are getting ready to have dinner. Would you like to join us? And she said, well, I was in research at heaven. And she said, I was leaving the next day. She said, I wanted to get as much done as I could. So I apologized and said, no. Uh, and she said, so Dorothy left the room. And she said, all of a sudden, she got this, uh, what did she saw? A uh, swipe from her parents <laughs> who had long, passed, had long ago passed away. said, daughter. You don't do things like that. If someone invites you to dinner, you go. So the next time when Dorothy came back and said, Charles and I are getting ready to have dinner now, she said, would you like to join us? She says, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but but she, that was just the way she was. She was just an uh, outgoing, an uh, excellent cook, excellent cook. Uh, I've been to her house. Uh, we had a, a lady down from uh, the Schomburg Library came down for, um, I used to do a program called um, 
at homes and we would invite uh, people in to uh, talk about their lives. And of course, Dorothy was the one that helped us get those people there. And I think she might have paid their way there because we couldn't pay them. So uh, we had a lady that came in and uh, so Dorothy invited us to her house for dinner. And Lord have mercy, you talking about a scrumptious meal. Dorothy was a good, and they tell me she could sew. So she was a good homemaker as well as uh, an excellent librarian and professional woman. She, uh, she had lots of different skills. So uh, just um, someone that I, I admire very, very deeply. And again, this was a labor of love. And it's, on the back of the book, you'll see that also she was known as the shopping bag lady. And of course, the story goes that uh, whenever the undertaker was taking a body out of the house, she was going in, as they were coming out, she was going in with her shopping bags to get, uh, get the materials. So, uh, <laughs> and that was one of her staff that said that. So uh, uh, I'm thinking that it's probably true. She did get a lot of materials. Dorothy, and she knew about the things like posters and things that people didn't think were important she, uh, other than the books. She knew that those kinds of things would be important as well. So she collected all kinds of materials like that. Uh, for the collection. So that, again, is why a lot of people come there uh, because of the fact that not just the printed information, but also the ephemeral, ephemeral information that's there that they can look at as well. So uh, she was an excellent curator and librarian. Yes. Did you, in your research, get a sense of how she um, saw sort of um, the collection of African American history and Africana studies? Um, how, how she saw it playing into empowerment and and activism. Um, did you get a sense of like because certainly her her interest went beyond collecting. She saw this material as necessary for empowering yes, she black did. people. Mm -hmm. So could you say something about was she a Pan Africanist? Did she believe was she more on the left in terms mm -hmm. of protest? politics, just some sense of how, how does this material get activated in the black experience? Well, I, I don't know. With one thing she does, she, she was a member of the African Studies Association, so she did do a lot in African history materials and things of that nature. She encouraged you. She didn't come out, uh, I don't, I can't say if she's left or right, I, but she was very activist and she encouraged people to, to protest and to be active in whatever it was they were doing. So she wanted you to succeed, and she wanted to see us succeed. So she was definitely a part of all of that. She, not uh, actually in the forefront as much, uh, but she was actually there. She did more, I think, encouraging, and her thing was to get you the information. And that's basically what we as librarians do. We're the information people. So we make the information accessible to you so that you can go on and do what it is you need to do. Uh, uh, <laughs> Okay. Well, one of the thoughts I had was what she would think of the new African American Museum that's finally being built because it seems to me that in many ways she really was kind of the, the bibliographic librarian uh, kind of piece of that history, promotion of the history of uh, African Americans and would get, get great pride and probably been behind yeah. in some ways of this yeah. library. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about it. I know that uh, when that museum opens for the very first time, uh, the Smithsonian Libraries has a, a library in every one of the museums, but they don't normally advertise it as being open to the public. And this is the plan now is for that uh, museum library to be announced as being open to the public, which, you know, is again kind of a step forward and something that I'm sure she would have encouraged Definitely. if she were in, involved in that. Um, well, I would like, Janet, to commend you on a couple of things. One is I'm glad to know that Yale has huge backlogs of unprocessed <laughs> materials. And plus, they are closing, I think, 15 to 16. I guess to, to, to process, hopefully process some of those collections, so they do have a backlog. Uh, secondly, I like what you did in the book by talking about an important, I mean, you are gathering together a lot of material for future work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went through the lists in the back, and I came up with the several names of people I know and that I remembered. 
One is Hiram Davis. I don't know how many people here remember Hiram, Fern does, uh, who came out to speak at, uh, at Howard. Uh, he was worked at the Library of Congress uh, for a number of years, uh, briefly. Well, actually, it was about three years, but he came from Michigan State. Uh, but secondly, the idea that your book is really a step towards a larger biography of Dorothy, which you talk about. Now, are you interested in doing that biography? <laughs> I think it's better for somebody younger. <laughs> hey, I always say somebody needs tenure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a Dorothy Porter trait that you share with, with Dorothy. Yes. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, there is going to be a book signing out in the uh, foyer outside, but uh, just to help remember your day here, I'd like to present you with, as a book person, one book person to another, the Center for the Book Super Deluxe Book Bag. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has wooden handles, and this is made of burlap, so this doesn't go to everybody. He must know that I collect bags. <laughs> I guess it's most librarians do. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank I you so much. It. Thank you. Let's and give I her a final it. round of applause and meet out back. Okay. Thanks a lot. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.